So now let me introduce Dr. Jimenez. Dr. Jimenez emigrated with his family from Mexico to California and worked with his parents in the field. He attended Santa Clara University and received his master's and PhD from Columbia University under a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship. He is now a professor emeritus in the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures at Santa Clara. He has served on a number of professional boards and commissions and has received numerous awards over the years. And many of you know him through his four autobiographical books that have been included in the American Library Association's book list, 50 Best Young Adult Books of All Time. Some of you have read the book here. How many of you have read some of his books? Oh, wonderful. Okay. So I ask that you hold your uh, questions or any comments till after the lecture is over. Please join me in welcoming Dr. San Francisco Menace. Good afternoon. Occasions like this gives us, a, gives us an opportunity to uh, tell our stories. And uh, when we tell our stories, we make connections. Let me get, uh, for example, if I were to ask you, how many of you in this room were born in another country? Could you raise your hands? How about, uh, how many of your parents were born in another country? Wow. Grandparents? So just about all the hands go up. And now if I were to ask you, do you know why your parents or grandparents or great-grandparents came to this country? I suspect the answer would be the same. They came to this country looking for a better life, right? Um, so we do all have a lot in common. And we, when we begin to tell our stories, for example, um, if, I, if, I, if you were to form small groups, and tell why your parents came here or grandparents, I suspect that there will be a lot of similarities uh, why they came here. And so when we tell our stories, we make connections. And when we make connections, we begin to break down all those walls that separate us from one another. When we begin to see ourselves reflected in the different faces that make up the, uh, the, the diversity that exists in our, in, our com in our communities, in our nation. And we are a great, powerful nation precisely because we are, for the most part, a, a nation made up of immigrants or descendants of immigrants, right? Um, so that's what we, and so when we begin to uh, tell our stories and we make connections, we break those walls that separate us from one another, and we begin to take comfort and we rejoice in the fact that we're all members of the same family, the human family. And so that's where my story begins. My story is not unique. It's the story of many families. It's probably your story. And so my story begins in Mexico many, many years ago when I was born. I was born in San Pedro Tlaquepaque in the state of Jalisco. And some people from Jalisco, there you go. <laughs> See, we already have a connection right there. And uh, San Pedro Tlaquepaque is near Guadalajara. And so my parents decided to cross the border uh, without documentation. And uh, from, and so, for those of you who have not read the book, um, I'll tell you the story. And for those who have read the book, you'll see some of the images that were taken during that period of time that I described as the, yeah, the, the experiences in the book. So we crossed the border without documentations. And the reason for that was that my parents never had the opportunity to go to school. Neither of them ever learned to read and to write. Um, so they didn't know how to go about getting our documentation in order. And as you know, to get documentation uh, requires financial resources. We didn't have those financial resources. So we crossed the border and we ended up in Santa Maria, the next slide, in Santa Maria, California. 
<laughs> and a little kid that you see next to Trampita, that's your truly Panchito, that's me. I'm going to read uh, an excerpt from the, from the circuit where I describe Kent City. The, all, the circuit, the stories from the life of a migrant child, the first book, I relate those stories from the child's point of view. And my hope was that I would um, make this, the book, accessible to both children and, and, and adults. So here's a description of the circuit of the uh, tent city. We call it tent city. Everybody called it tent city, although it was neither a city nor a town. It was a farm worker labor camp owned by she strawberry farms. Tent city had no address. It was simply known as rural Santa Maria. It was on Main Street, about 10 miles east of the center of town, and a mile north of it was a city dump. Many of the residents in the camp were single men, most of whom, like us, had crossed the border illegally. There were a few single women and a few families, all Mexican. Mama asked Papa to seal the base of the tent by piling extra dirt, extra dirt about six inches high all around it so that animals, especially snakes, could not crawl underneath during the night. When Papa finished, Mama pleaded with him to build the floor. He agreed and every evening after he came home from work, he sent Roberto and me to the city dump to look for discarded lumber to build a floor inside our tent. We went back several more times until we got enough lumber to complete the floor. We also picked up pieces of linoleum and laid them over the wood to cover the holes and slivers. The different shapes and colors made the floor look like a quilt. More uh, descriptions about this picture. The man that you see there with the hat on, uh, his, his name was Francisco. We called him Don Pancho. And, and you know from um, that in Spanish, the title uh, Don is given to people out of respect. As a matter of fact, uh, if you call someone uh, like uh, Don Miguel or Don, uh, Don, uh, Don Fernando or whatever your first name is, using the Don, uh, it's probably the highest compliment you can give a person, right? And some of you might see the, the, uh, the popular uh, television show they call him Don Francisco, right? It's Don Francisco. Some of you might have read Don Quixote, right? Um, so we used to call him Don, Don, pa Don, pa Don Pancho, Don Francisco. And, and uh, Don Pancho is the one who gave us that parrot that I talk about in the circuit. Um, remember the parrot? Yeah. Yeah, he said yes. Don Pancho, um, like my parents, uh, did not have the opportunity to go to school, so he never learned to read and to write. But like my parents, Don Pancho was very, very intelligent and very talented, and he knew, he knew a large number of folk tales and legends, like La Leyenda de la Llorona. And before I began writing the circuit and was doing research, I lamented the fact that I didn't have the opportunity to record all these wonderful ghost stories and legends that I heard from Don Pancho, uh, because if I had been able to record them and then transcribe them, it would have been a bestseller. Um, Don Pancho also had a, a, a great sense of humor, and he said that the, that the parrot that he gave us was also uh, without documentation. <laughs> said that uh, before he crossed him, uh, before he crossed him uh, uh, across the border, he said, Le, uh, I gave him tequila, gave him tequila to, to relax him so he wouldn't make any noise. <laughs> I'm 
sure he was just joking, but that guy, that, he had a great sense of humor. And, the, and unfortunately, Don Pancho uh, was caught by the Border Patrol on one of the Border Patrol raids and deported back to Mexico. And I never saw him again. But in um, but many ways, when you read the circuit and my other works, in many ways, Don Pancho is an author of my work, right? Because Don Pancho, uh, um, from Don Pancho I learned the art of storytelling. And Don Pancho represents to me many people in our communities, in your community, in people in the, in, throughout the world who are highly intelligent, highly talented, but for various reasons, mainly because of poverty, um, they don't have the opportunity to go to school. They have to work to, earn, to, to survive. But you can imagine how much, uh, how much uh, healthier our democracy would be, how much healthier our society would be, how much, uh, um, how much uh, healthier our world would be if every, everyone would have the opportunity to go to school. Like Don Pancho. And when I was in graduate school, which I describe in this fourth book, I had uh, Professor Alessio Eduardo, who was a writer. And, I, and uh, when I was, um, when I showed him some of my recollections that I described in the circuit, uh, he suggested that I write my story. And so I began writing Cajas de Cartón, the Spanish, the Spanish, the title story is in Spanish. And when I began writing, I immediately thought about the promise that I had made on that march to Sacramento. And I immediately realized that what I was beginning, as I began writing, that I was not just writing about my family, but then I was writing the stories of many families from the past and the present. That through my writing, I was going to help um, our society, our readers, to gain a better understanding of the plight of farm workers. And so that's why I write. I write to chronicle part of my family's history, but more important, more important, I want to document the experiences of many, many families from the past and the present. Families who worked very hard from sunup to sundown. In many cases for very low wages, working under very difficult conditions, and living in poor living quarters, and what sustains these and, and their hard and noble work, their hard and noble work, makes it possible for all of us to enjoy our meals every day. And, and what sustains these families day in, day in and day out is the hope and dream of having a better life for their children and their children's children, right? So, in, the, in that sense, their story is really your story because the, the story of the Mexican uh, farm workers is an important and integral part of the American story. It is part of American history. You see? And so that's why I write. And so I'll stop there and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Let me, uh, let me just say this one more thing. I, I would, uh, since I, I want to thank Ms. Cahill for doing this series because as I started my talk, it's really important to share your stories because when we share our stories, we make connections. And let me, let me read something um, that, to encourage you to tell your own stories. Um, there's a, a famous uh, writer, Madeline de Engel, uh, who, who says the following. If you 
you don't, if you don't recount your family's history, it will be lost. Remember this. If you don't recount your family history, it will be lost. Honor your own stories and tell them too. The tales may not seem very important, but they are what binds families and makes each of us who we are. So I would encourage you to, if you haven't already done so, to begin documenting your own family's history, your own family stories, and then pass them on to your children and your grandchildren, because that's who, what makes us who we are, right? And it grounds children, your children, the grandchildren, uh, and, and gives them a sense of where they are, who they are and where they come from. It's so important you know, to do that. Okay. And with all the technology that we have now, you can record them, videotape them. Uh, it's, it's so um, I would encourage you to do that. Okay. When the book came out, I, um, I was invited to Hancock Community College to give a talk, and Mr. Milo was there. Uh, and um, who was, uh, uh, Mr. Penny was there, my high school counselor, uh, and a few other teachers that I had in high school. And, and, and I took the opportunity to thank them for what they did for me. And, and, and it was uh, a very emotional, uh, uh, so it was a love fest. And, uh, he, the, and his wife was there, and uh, it was very, very, yeah, so it gave me a check. Before I begin writing the circuit, there's, I talk about Mr. Lemma, uh, who during his lunch hour would help me with my English. I went to the, to the Visalia looking to see if I could contact him. Never, never was able to contact him. To thank him also, I wanted to, to meet him and say, you know what you did for me? Um, he probably never realized the, how much he touched me. You know, I wanted to be a teacher because of him. I had no idea what it meant, but, but because he cared about me and he, and he valued my Mexican culture and he, you know, and he probably, and my wife, when she read this, when she heard this story, she says, I wonder what Mr. Lema would have said. You know, I spent all this time to, trying to help him and then I would leave, he left, and what, what good did, it, did I do? Mm -hmm. Little didn't know that he touched, he, he changed my life, you know, that because of him, I wanted to be a teacher, yeah. And that's why I tell teachers that it's, it's a wonderful profession, that you touch so many lives, <coughs> even though children will never tell you, and you don't realize it, but you are making a huge difference in children's lives. I mean, it's, it's just a wonderful profession. I, I have the greatest respect for teachers and admiration and gratitude. They're, they're just, for me, teachers are really the guardians of our society. Really are, really are. And, and it's unfortunate that our society does not um, give them the respect and, and in many ways that they deserve financial as well. <laughs> <laughs>
to bring my daughter. My daughter wants to be a writer to kind of find inspiration and in taking um, a love for our Latin roots. And then my daughter also has special needs. So it's two things that we're embracing and it's just very inspirational to me. And it, and it made me realize compared to him, I, I take my education for granted now. And now, and, and to him, education was like gold. So I had to be like him when he was younger so that I can really get my studies up. His way of contributing to the movement was by writing the story. So I, I took that away. That was very important to me. Uh, the importance of family and education and how bringing your culture and your family together can help you push through into higher education. This is the third time we're lucky enough to host Dr. Jimenez. He was gracious enough to speak to us for three times. And I've heard his talk now three times. And although it's the same linear, linear history, I pick up something new every time. It's either an emotion he shares about growing up with his family, or a historical fact, or I love the way he can resonate with the children. I know a lot of the sixth graders are reading his book, but he seems to have such a connection with the children. And they seem to, you get to that age, I don't know if they're listening to their parents and some of their parents who have similar stories, but they're listening to him. And I think that makes such a difference, and especially in this climate we're in right now. The part where he talks about where it's not just his story, but multiple families. Francisco's comments about teachers, because I can attest to that. My mother was a school teacher, and you you do uh, realize the effect, or, or sometimes don't, the effect that that a teacher has on a child's life. So I appreciated those comments today. Uh, la marcha de que cuando él participó con César Chávez, lo que simbolizó para él el pelear por los derechos civiles de las personas cuando él vio la bandera de Estados Unidos. A fundamental message, what he had to say, is that education is the key. It opens up opportunities, it opens up personal choices, and it's something that cannot be taken away from you.